Greetings. Sorry that I've been offline for a while. I've been busy. This Bible study on this Sabbath day is going to be on Messianic Judaism. Is it the fulfillment of faith in the Messiah? Or is it a Trojan horse for Christianity? For those of you that don't know what the Trojan horse is, well, the younger crowd knows what a Trojan horse is in computer science. It is something that appears as one thing, but it's actually something different. Like people think they're getting a free coupon for hamburger, and then they click on a link, and then somebody takes over their computer with uh, some malware, malicious software. But for those of you that don't know what the Trojan horse was, and even if you didn't watch the movie Troy, there was a city-state named Troy, and they had very high and thick walls. And the Greeks were at war with Troy, and they couldn't take the city because of the thick walls, thick and high walls. So what they did was, is they built a large wooden horse, and they hid soldiers inside this large wooden horse that they had put placed outside the gate of the city. And then the Greeks and their ships sailed away. And the people of Troy thought, well, okay, the, the Greeks gave up, they took off. Well, they took the, this huge wooden horse, they brought it inside the gates of the city. And then they had a big celebration, everybody got drunk, fell asleep, you know, probably 1, 2 o'clock, 3 o'clock in the morning. The Greek soldiers climbed out by stealth, climbed out of the Trojan horse attacked the guards that were guarding the gate of the city, and they opened the gate, and there outside the gate is the entire Greek army. They poured into Troy, and all the soldiers that were drunk and asleep, they killed them all. So they destroyed Troy. That was the Trojan horse. So, it was a trick, a trap, also, you've probably heard the expression, beware of Greeks bearing gifts. Well, the Trojan horse was a gift, and it was given to them by the Greeks. So, Messianic Judaism. Is it really what it appears to be? A lot of this information I've covered in previous studies, but, you know, sometimes I get new people that come, and they need to know this information also. Now, for those of you that are thinking, well, you know, this guy's just a plain old Jew hater. Well, let's examine what they believe. And are Messianic Jews really just Jewish Christians, or are they something different? Let's take a look. In the book of Ephesians, there was a guy. His name was Paul. He was called Saul of Tarsus until... Christ got a hold of him. And in Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 11, and for those of you that don't know it, Ephesus was a city in Greece that Paul had went to, and then he started a church in Ephesus. And they called it the book of Ephesians, which means a resident of Ephesus. So in Ephesians 5.11, Paul writes, And have no fellowship, with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. If you look up that word reprove, as in reprove them, it means to expose. So we're to expose the unfruitful works of darkness. So Messianic Judaism, is it Jewish Christianity, or is it unfruitful works of darkness that should be exposed. Well, let's take a look. All right. Messianic Jews, they don't call themselves 
Christians. They want to be known as Jews. Okay. And uh, let's take a look at the book, the book of Acts, chapter 11, verse 26. And when he had found him, he brought him into Antioch. And it came to pass that a whole year they assembled themselves with the church, the church, not the synagogue, the church, and taught much people. And the disciples were called Christians first in Antioch. Now there's people that will tell you that this is a term of derision. What does it mean, derision? It, they're saying it's a bad word, okay? Oh, you're one of those Christians, you know. But let's take a look at Acts chapter 26 and verse 28. Paul is talking to King Agrippa, okay? And Paul was taken into custody for teaching heresy. What was he teaching? Christianity. He was teaching people about Jesus, okay? And who accused him of this heresy stuff? The Jews. Okay. Now, let's see. Let's see where we're going to go back. We're going to go to Acts 26. Let's start at Acts chapter 26 and verse 1. I have a feeling this is going to be a long study. But we're going to let the Bible explain the Bible, okay? This is not my opinion. This is what's recorded in the King James Bible, who, or which I should say, Messianic Jews will tell you is mistranslated. Oh, okay. So, where do I find a properly translated Bible? And then they'll probably, promptly tell you that, well, you know, we know what the Bible really says. I think I'll stick with the King James. And trust me, I was investigating the Messianic Jews because I wanted to have fellowship with them. And when they started telling me things that Paul was a false apostle, that the Bible was mistranslated by those pagan satanic Greeks, and um, things of that nature. And when they started lying to me about what some of the things that Jews actually really believe, I became extremely suspicious quickly because I've had so-called Messianic Jews that claim to believe in, well, they don't call him Jesus, they call him Yeshua. And being that the New Testament was written in Greek, Yeshua doesn't appear anywhere in the Greek New Testament. It's a made-up word as far as the New Testament is concerned. Now, you can argue it's in the Old Testament, but we don't call it. There's a book in the Bible that they claim is that word, but it's the sixth book of the Christian Bible. You've heard of Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. The next book is called Joshua, not Yeshua. Joshua. Joshua. And it means something along the lines of Savior or Salvation. Because Joshua took over where Moses left off. Moses died. He saw the promised land, but he didn't go into the promised land. He died. So let's read Acts chapter 26 that Jews will tell you that are it's wrong. You know, it's funny... You claim to believe the Bible, but yet then you go around telling people it's wrong. Hmm, 
then why do you believe it? Why do you claim to believe it? Of course, they always want to tell you the right thing. That's their opinion. All right. Then Agrippa said unto Paul, Thou art permitted to speak for thyself. Now, Paul's on a trial here. Then Paul stretched forth the hand and answered for himself. I think myself happy, King Agrippa, because I shall answer for myself this day before thee touching all the things whereof I am accused of the Romans? No. Whereof I am accused of the Jews. So it was the Jews accusing Paul, not the Romans. Okay? Especially because I know thee to be an expert in all customs and questions which are among the Jews, whereof I beseech thee to hear me patiently. My manner of life from my youth, which was at the first among mine own nation at Jerusalem, know all the Jews. See, Paul was raised as a rabbi at the feet of a great rabbi named Gamaliel, who's even mentioned in the Bible. And I've read some of Gamaliel's writings in a book called the Talmud, which is the Jews' interpretation of the Bible. Uh, probably thousands of rabbis through time, okay? So the Jews knew of Paul. They know him. I mean, he was a student. This guy was a scholar, okay? Verse 4. Um, okay, my manner of life from my youth, which was at the first among mine own nation at Jerusalem, know all the Jews, which knew me from the beginning, if they would testify that after the most straightest sect of our religion, I lived a Pharisee. A Pharisee is a denomination of Jews. All Pharisees are Jews. Maybe not all Jews are Pharisees, but all Pharisees are Jews. It's sort of like Baptists, okay? You got Baptists, Methodists, um, Lutherans, Presbyterians, and, you know. And now I stand and am judged for the hope of the promise made of God unto our fathers, unto which promise our twelve tribes, instantly serving God day and night, Hope to come, for which sake, King Agrippa, I am accused of the Jews. Why should it be thought a thing incredible with you that God should raise the dead? Can God raise the dead? Of course he can. I verily thought with myself that I ought to do many things contrary to the name of Jesus of Nazareth which thing I also did in Jerusalem, and many of the saints did I shut up in prison, having received authority from the chief priests. And when they were put to death, I gave my voice against them. These chief priests are not Catholics. They're Jewish priests. Okay? And many of the saints, what saints? The Christian saints. And many of the saints did I shut up in prison, having received authority from the chief priests, and when they were put to death, I gave my voice against them. So Paul's admitting right here that the Christian saints were put in prison, having received authority from the Jewish priests, and they were put to death. It was the Jews killing the Christians, by authority of the Rush, uh, Romans. And I punished them oft in every synagogue and compelled them to blaspheme and being exceeding, exceedingly mad against them, I persecuted them even unto strange cities. It doesn't sound like it's the Romans persecuting the Christians here, does it? No. Verse 12, whereupon... As I went to Damascus with authority and commission from the chief priests, not the Romans, the Jews, at midday, O king, I saw in the way a light from heaven about the brightness of the sun shining round about me and them which journeyed with me. 
And when we were all fallen to the earth, I heard a voice speaking unto me and saying in the Hebrew tongue, Saul, Saul, why, persecute, why persecutest thou me? Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Okay. Why persecutest thou me? It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And I said, Who art thou, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. But rise and stand upon thy feet, for I have appeared unto thee for this purpose, to make thee a minister and a witness, both of these things which thou hast seen, and of those things in the which I will appear unto thee. Delivering thee from the people and from the Gentiles, unto whom now I send thee, to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light, and from the power of Satan unto God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them, which are sanctified by faith that is in me. Faith. Forgiveness of sins and faith. Okay? That's the things we ought to be, be preaching. Not Shemitahs. Not feasts. Not blood moons. Okay? Not these stupid rituals. Not obscure laws in the Old Testament. We should be teaching faith in Christ and forgiveness of sins. This is Jesus talking to Paul. That they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith. Sanctified by faith that is in me. Whereupon, O King Agrippa, I was not disobedient unto the heavenly vision but showed first unto them at Damascus and at Jerusalem and throughout all the coasts of Judea and then to the Gentiles that they should repent and turn to God and do works meet for repentance. For these causes the Jews, not the Romans, for these causes the Jews caught me in the temple and went about to kill me. The Messianic Jews will lie and tell you that it was the Romans killing the Christians. Read this to them and then they'll say, well, you know, the Bible was mistranslated by those pagan satanic Greeks. Because the, the New Testament was originally written in Hebrew, but there are no Hebrew manuscripts of the Old Testament anywhere. They can't show you any. They don't exist. But there's over 5,000 New Testament Greek manuscripts. Oh, yeah. You've heard of Ephesians? Yeah. You heard of Philippians? Okay. You heard of Galatians? Okay. Those were all Greek cities. Paul taught them in Greek. That's the New Testament, people. Philippi, Ephesus, Colossians, Colossae, Galatia, Galatia, Galatians. For these causes, the Jews caught me in the temple and went about to kill me. Having thereof obtained help of God, I continue unto this day, witness, witnessing both to small and great, saying none other things than those which the prophets of Moses did, did say should come, that Christ should suffer, and that he should be the first, and that should rise from the dead, and should show light unto the people and to the Gentiles. Verse 24. And as, and as he thus spake for himself, Festus said with a loud voice, Paul, thou art beside thyself. Much learning doth make thee mad. 
when somebody says you're beside yourself, that means you're crazy. You know, much learning, you know, all this learning is making you crazy. And for those of you that don't know it, Agrippa, King Agrippa was Herod Agrippa. His family controlled the, um, the Jewish temple, the temple of Herod, which was what was going on back in the days of Christ. When Christ went to the temple and took the whip and drove the money changers out of the temple, Herod, King Herod, was in charge. Okay? That was his temple. When the Romans destroyed the temple in 70 AD, when the Jews revolted against Roman rule, that was the temple that was destroyed and burned and just totally obliterated. Okay? So that's who King Agri uh, Herod Agrippa was. Now, Festus was some kind of a uh, Roman governor of some sort. I, I don't know my history as well as I probably should. I know the Bible better than I know my history. So, Paul, thou art beside thyself. Doth learning doth make thee mad. But he said, I am not mad, most noble Festus, but speak forth the words of truth and soberness. For the king knoweth of these things, before whom also I speak freely. For I am persuaded that none of these things are hidden from him. For this thing was not done in a corner. King Agrippa, believest thou the prophets? I know that thou believest. Then Agrippa said unto Paul, Almost persuadest Almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. Ooh, there's that terrible word of derision. Oh, you're almost, you're going to be one of those Christians. Ooh. Paul, almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. What's Paul's response? Oh, no, King Agrippa. No, 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 no. We don't call ourselves Christians. We call ourselves Messianic Jews. No, no, that's not what Paul said. Verse 29. And Paul said, I would to God that not only thou, but also all that hear me this day, were both almost and altogether such as I am, except these bonds. Hmm. Paul didn't say, oh, don't call me that terrible word, Christian. Oh, no, don't do that. Then Agrippa said unto Paul, almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. And Paul said, I would to God that not only thou, but also all that hear me this day were both almost and all together such as I am. Paul didn't call himself a Messianic Jew. He says, such as I am, a Christian, except these bonds. And when he had thus spoken, the king rose up and the governor and Bernice, and they that sat with them, and when they were gone aside, they talked between themselves, saying, This man doeth nothing worthy of death or of bonds. Then said Agrippa unto Festus, This man might have been set at liberty if he had not appealed unto Caesar. You see, Caesar was the emperor of Rome, and Paul was a Roman citizen. So when the Jews tried to kill Paul, there was a, a riot, and Roman soldiers came to investigate it. And then when the Roman soldiers saw that the Jews were trying to kill Paul, a Roman citizen, they protected him. But the Jews accused Paul of stirring up trouble. So the Roman soldiers, you know, it's like if you're um, a U.S. citizen in a foreign country and you're at the U.S. Embassy. Supposedly, the U.S. Embassy should protect the American citizens. That's what they're supposed to exist for. Not necessarily true, but that's what they're supposed to exist for. It was, you know, did, did 
did Paul say, oh, don't use that word Christian? No. He says, I wish all you would, you know, were both almost and all together, such as I am, Christians. Is it a term of derision? No. What does 1 Peter 4.16 say? Peter, a second witness. Yet if any man suffer as a Christian, ooh, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on this behalf. Is being called a Christian a horrible word? You'd think so, listening to the Messianic Jews. Yet if any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on this behalf. Huh. They, uh, does it, you know, why don't the Messianic Jews call themselves Christians? Maybe because they're not. I mean, let's face it. There's a Jewish group called Chabad. I don't know if I'm pronouncing it properly, but it's C-H-A-B-A-D. And their Messiah, he died, by the way, and he didn't raise from the dead. At least not yet. He will at the white throne judgment. His name was Rabbi Menachem Schneerson, S-C-H-N-E-E-R-S-O-N. That was their Messiah. So when these Chabad Jews would go to you and tell you that they're Messianic Jews, well, they're not talking about the Jesus of the New Testament. They're talking about Rabbi Schneerson. And he had a thing called the Noahide Laws. The seven laws of Noah. Where are the seven laws of Noah in the Bible? Uh, nowhere. Nowhere. Where do these Jews get this from? Oh, well, you see, God gave Noah secret knowledge. Hmm, yeah. Uh, he didn't write it down in the Bible. But, but we've got the true knowledge of God. It's not in the scriptures, but we got the true knowledge of God. See, this is Jewish traditions and fables. So what's a fable? It's a fairy tale, okay? Uh, Hansel and Gretel, Greta, Gretel, uh, the goose that laid the golden egg, you know, perhaps you remember those stories from, you know, old times. Well, those are fables. You know, they're like children's stories. Nonsense, okay? What does the Bible say about fables? 1 Timothy 1, chapter 4. I mean, uh, chapter 1, verse 4. Neither give, give heed, in other words, don't pay attention, neither give heed to fables and endless genealogies, which minister questions rather than godly edifying, which is in faith, so do. First uh, Timothy chapter 4, verse 7 but refuse profane and old wives' fables, and exercise thyself rather unto godliness. 2 Timothy 4, verse 4, 4, 4. And they shall turn away their ears from the truth, that's Christ, okay? And they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. That's what the Noahide laws are. They don't exist in the Bible. A Jewish rabbi that rejects Jesus came up with the Noahide laws, the seven laws of Noah. They're not in the Bible. So what does the Bible say about that? Titus, the book of Titus, chapter 1, and verse 14. Not giving heed, in other words, don't pay attention, not giving heed to Jewish fables and commandments of men that turn from the truth. Yeah. Yeah, that's 
that's what Jewish fables are. The seven Noahide laws, the seven laws of Noah. They're not in the scriptures. They're an invention of the Jewish mind. They're Jewish fables. And we're not to give heed to them. We're not supposed to listen to them. Commandments of men that turn from the truth. If it's not in the scriptures, it's not the truth. Okay? So why is it that Messianic Jews don't call themselves Christians? Maybe because they're not. Are they a Trojan horse? I'm beginning to think so. Turn to Matthew chapter 15 and verse 1. And the Messianic Jews will tell you that Matthew is totally mistranslated. Absolutely will tell you that this book was originally written in Hebrew and then these satanic pagan Greeks mistranslated the Bible. They will tell you that every word that I'm about to read to you is not true. Now, a scribe is somebody that would copy the scriptures. You've heard of the word scribble? It comes from the word scribe. It means to copy, to write. Um, if you study Spanish and German, uh, I think it's a scribe, a scribe or something like that, a scriven or something. I don't know how to pronounce the word, but it, it, it has scribe in the word, and it means to write. So they were the copyists of the law. And like I said, a, a Pharisee was a denomination of Jew, of Jews. All Pharisees are Jews. Not all Jews are Pharisees, but all Pharisees are Jews. And for those of you that don't know it, all the Jews that follow the commentary on the law, which is called the Talmud, all those people are the direct descendants, modern day descendants of the Pharisees that Jesus condemned over and over and over. And there's not a Messianic Jew out there that will believe one word of what I'm about to read to you in Matthew, Matthew chapter 15 and verse 1. Because, you know, the thing is, there, a lot of what the Messianic Jews um, teach is true. You know, I, I mean, I agree with them as far as Easter is satanic and pagan. Um, Christmas, the Christmas tree. Read Jeremiah chapter 10. Matter of fact, it was the Jews that were celebrating Christmas before the, uh, the Christians were. Jeremiah is an Old Testament book. And Jeremiah condemned the Jews for putting up Christmas trees. I mean, read it. What time of the year do people cut trees down and decorate them? Uh, December. Okay. The Christians learned this from the Jews. And then the Jews will condemn, you know, the Christians for doing the same thing that they did. Isn't that the definition of a hypocrite? Uh, yeah. Easter. Easter is the queen of heaven. She was also known as Ishtar. Okay? Turn to Jeremiah chapter 7 and verse 18. Now the Jews will accuse um, the Catholic Church of, you know, they turn Mary into the queen of heaven, which they do. I mean, I got to admit, they do. But the book of Jeremiah is a rebuke against Jerusalem and the Jews and Israel. I mean, they were going to kill Jeremiah. They didn't like what he had to say, but he was a prophet of the Lord, and he was rebuking them for their wickedness. So let's read Jeremiah chapter 7 and verse 18. The children gather wood, and the fathers kindle the fire, and the women knead their dough. You know, kneading the dough is, you know, you take flour and you mix in some yeast and water and you, when you're kneading it, you're, you're basically mixing it. Okay? 
Uh, if you ever go to a pizzeria, they take the dough and they they push it down and make it a you know a circle, a flat circle like a pancake, and then you know they put the cheese and tomato sauce. Well, that's kind of like kneading the dough. The children gather wood and the fathers kindle the fire and the women knead their dough to make cakes to make cakes to the queen of heaven and to pour out drink offerings unto other gods. Gods, plural, S, gods, G-O-D-S. That they may provoke me to anger. And who's the me? The Lord God of heaven. Of God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Some people say Yahweh, other people say Jehovah. I don't know. So, the children gathered the wood, the fathers made the fire, the women kneaded the dough, they made cakes to the Queen of Heaven, and they poured out drink offerings to other gods, which were the devils, that they may provoke me to anger. So, where did this Queen of Heaven stuff come from? The Jews. They And the Jews learned it from the Egyptians and the Babylonians and, you know, all these other satanic cultures. Matter of fact, the Catholic Church, they take Mary and they elevate her and make her the Queen of Heaven. Believe it or not, they do. You've heard of Isis, you've heard of Ishtar, Easter, uh, Semiramis. Uh, she's got many, many, many different names in history. So, but the Catholics call her Mary, the mother of God. But, sorry, it's not the same Mary that was carried Jesus. Nope. So let's go back to Matthew chapter 15, verse 1. Messianic Jews will tell you, again, I told you, they, they say this is all mistranslated. You see, God is so weak that he wasn't able to preserve his words. That's basically what they're telling you. Those pagan satanic Greeks took that Hebrew New Testament and then they mistranslated it. And they turned the Bible into anti-Semitism. Oh, boy. That's what they tell you. And um, so let's read it. Matthew 15, verse 1. Then came to Jesus scribes and Pharisees, Jews, which were of Jerusalem, saying, Why do thy disciples transgress the tradition of the elders? What's the tradition of the elders? That's their Talmud. Talmud means learning. Do you know where the Talmud was codified? When you codified means they assembled it and put it all together. For example, if you wanted to create a encyclopedia, perhaps you've heard of the Encyclopedia Britannica. Um, before the internet they had collections of books called the encyclopedia. So if you didn't want to go to the library, a lot of families had encyclopedias so that you could look up a subject. Well, the Encyclopedia Britannica was an English or British collection of articles written by various authors that were supposedly experts in their field. Well, it was codified, it was assembled, and put together in the British, you know, in England, the United Kingdom, Great Britain, Encyclopedia Britannica. Well, the Talmud, which means learning, was assembled and put together in Babylon. Hmm. Matter of fact, if you go to Amazon, you know, the book place on the internet, type in Babylonian, B-A-B-Y-L-O-N-I-A-N, two words, T-A-L-M-U-D, 
Talmud means learning. So it's Babylonian learning. Think about that the next time you read hear the book of Revelation about the mystery Babylon the Great. Babel, perhaps you've heard of the Tower of Babel, Babel, means confusion. Babylon was built where the Tower of Babel was, or Babel. You heard of a baby babbling? That means they're just talking nonsense. Blah, 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 blah. Well, so Babylonian comes from a root word that means confusion. So it means confusion in learning. Babylonian Talmud means confusion in learning. This is what they call the tradition of the elders. So let's read. So the scribes which were of Jerusalem, okay, then came to Jesus, scribes and Pharisees which were of Jerusalem, saying, why do thy disciples transgress the tradition of the elders? For they wash not their hands when they eat bread. Now, come on. Your mother told you, wash your hands before you eat, right? But the Jews had turned something for cleanliness into a ritual. Okay? Verse 3. But he, and the he is Jesus, but he answered and said unto them, why do ye also transgress the commandment of God by your tradition? For God commanded, saying, Honor thy father and mother, and he that curseth father or mother, let him die the death. Hmm. That's in the Torah. That's in the law. That's in the law of Moses. And we're not talking about somebody that just, you know, says, Oh, father, you know, shit, you know, we're not talking that, we're not talking about a curse word, okay, we're talking somebody that curses their father, I curse you father, die, and do you know what it is to place a curse on somebody, I mean, you're talking like voodoo stuff, putting a curse on somebody, you know, it's a satanic ritual where you're trying to invoke De demon spirits to kill somebody. That's what a curse is. It's, it, you know, and, and they're speaking these words that are satanic, satanic to, you know, invoke demon spirits to go kill people. They're trying to kill their own mother and father. That's what we're talking about here. We're, we're not talking about somebody that's, you know, you know, mom and dad come and say, oh, Junior, clean up your room. It's a pigsty. Oh, you know, shit, Mom. You know, that's not that's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about somebody that's placing a satanic curse on their mother and father, invoking devil spirits to kill their parents. Okay? For God commanded, saying, Honor thy father and mother, and, and he that curseth father or mother, let him die the death. But ye say, okay, the Bible says that if you curse your mother or father, they're to let them die the death. You're supposed to kill these children. But ye say, the Jews, their tradition of the elders, but ye, so, but ye say, whosoever shall say to his father or his mother, it is a gift. In other words, if I curse you with the satanic ritual that, you know, invoking devil spirits that you die, the Jews say, well, you know, it's a gift. Yeah. Yeah, so when, when I take a hammer and beat you on the head, it's a gift. I'm giving you a gift. But ye say, the Jewish rabbis, but ye say, whosoever shall say to his father or his mother, it is a gift, by whatsoever thou mightest be profited by me. So if I pick up a hammer and knock you on the head, it's a gift. You're being profited by me. And honor not his father or his mother, he shall be free. In other words, the Bible says you should kill these children before they try to kill the parents. But the Jews say, oh, he's free. You know, you know no, no, no. They, don't, they shouldn't die. They should be made free. 
and honor not his father or his mother, he shall be made free. Thus ye have made the commandment of God of none effect by your tradition. Rituals, people. Rituals. Traditions and are rituals. Ye hypocrites. Jesus is calling these Jews hypocrites. Ye hypocrites, well did Isaiah prophesy of you. Isaiah is the uh, Greek rendering of, the, of Isaiah. Ye hypocrites, well did Isaiah prophesy of you, saying, This people draweth nigh unto me with their mouth, and honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. But in vain. What is vain? It means something that's worthless. But in vain they do worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. They're teaching the doctrines of rabbis, not the commandments of God. What's the, what are the Noahide laws of Noah? The Noahide laws? Commandments of men. It's not in the Bible. Ooh. And he, Jesus, called the multitude and said unto them, Hear and understand. Not that which goeth into the mouth defileth a man. Ooh. You see, the Jews were saying, Oh, those pagan satanic Greeks, they were eating pork. They ate pig. They're defiled. They're unclean. They're spiritually dead because they ate pork. Not that which goeth into the mouth defileth a man, but that which come out of the mouth, this defileth a man. Jesus said, it's not what goes into your mouth that defiles you. It's what comes out of your mouth. Eating pork doesn't defile you. Personally, I think eating pork is a bad idea. It's unhealthy. It's unclean. You know, pigs are garbage eaters. They're the sewer system of the animal world. Okay? I wouldn't want to eat pig. I wouldn't want to eat rats. I wouldn't want to eat vultures. Okay? But if you eat them... That's not what defiles you in God's eyes. It's what comes out of your mouth. Verse 12. Then came his disciples and said unto him, Knowest thou that the Pharisees, the Jews, knowest thou that the Pharisees were offended after they heard this saying? Oh yeah, you offended those poor Pharisee Jews. And he answered, Jesus, and said, Every plant which my heavenly Father hath not planted shall be rooted up. Ooh. What do you do with weeds? You uproot them. You pull them out of the ground. Let them alone. They be blind leaders of the blind. Wow. Jesus is telling his disciples concerning the Jews, let them alone, they be blind leaders of the blind. And if the blind lead the, the blind, both shall fall into the ditch. You know, when you're going down a road, on both sides of the road, there's a ditch. You know, if you take anything to an extreme, you fall into the ditch. And yet the Jews will tell you, the Messianic Jews will tell you, this is wrong. Are they Christians? They don't call themselves Christians. They call themselves Messianic Jews. Who's their Messiah? Jesus? No, some guy named Yeshua, whoever that is. Maybe it's Rabbi Schneerson. I don't know. 
Okay, well, let's go to this uh, Matthew, which the Messianic Jews will tell you is wrong, mistranslated. See, God's an idiot. He, he couldn't even keep his, his, his scriptures straight. That's what the Messianic Jews were, are implying. Oh, the book of Matthew, it's wrong. Let's go to Matthew chapter 1, verse 20. Well, 19. Well, let's go back a little bit more. Uh, verse 18. Matthew 1 and verse 18. Now the birth of Jesus Christ, not Yeshua. Now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise. When, as his mother Mary was espoused to Joseph. When you're espoused, that means you're engaged. Okay, you're engaged. I mean, it's it's a done deal. You're going to be married. That's what it means. When, as his mother Mary was espoused to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. Before they came together. In other words, they hadn't had marital relations yet. Okay, they hadn't done it. She was found with child of the Holy Ghost. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not willing to make her a public example, was minded to put her away privily. He was going to divorce her, you know, privately. He didn't want her made a public example and uh, he didn't want to disgrace her. Verse 20. But while he thought on these things, okay, so he's thinking, how am I going to do this, you know? But while he thought on these things, behold... The angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife. For that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. So here it is, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream, told him, don't be afraid to take Mary, your wife, because, you know, the child that's in her belly, that's from the Holy Ghost. Verse 21. This is the angel of the Lord speaking unto Joseph in a dream. And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Yeshua. Oh, wait, it doesn't say that. Oh, this is that terrible, mistranslated Bible that the Messianic Jews are, will tell you. And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus. Jesus. And thou shalt call his name Jesus, not Yeshua. And thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Ooh. Now all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child, and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. How come the Messianic Jews don't call him Emmanuel? That's actually a word that appears in the New and the Old Testament. The only difference is, in the New Testament, it starts with an E, and in the Old Testament, it starts with an I. That is in the book of Isaiah, where it says, Behold, a virgin shall conceive, and, you know. Do you know that the new Jewish Bibles, they'll, they replace the word virgin with young woman? In other words, can a young woman not be a virgin and have a child? Absolutely. I mean, it's 12-year-old girls are getting pregnant now. Uh, are they virgins? Uh, I don't think so. Okay? 12 years old. Is that a young woman? Um, yeah. Yeah, I shudder to think. I, do you realize 12 years old is an, a, a, a sixth grader in elementary school? That's pretty young. Okay? That's pretty young. You think about it. Well, depending on the time of the year, okay, uh, that they entered school. 
and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. So, do we believe the Messianic Jews? Was this mistranslated? Or do we believe the scriptures? Take your pick. All right, Matthew chapter 1, verse 25. And he, Joseph, and he knew her not. In other words, he didn't have any relations with her. Uh, Mary, that is. And he knew her not till she had brought forth her firstborn son, and he called his name Jesus. And the Jews will tell you, well, you know, Jesus can't possibly be his name because the J didn't exist in the English language until a few hundred years ago. Okay, so there was no J in the English language, so Jesus doesn't exist. I guess Jews don't exist either, since J doesn't exist, right? So Jews don't exist because the J didn't exist in the English language until 400 years ago. So Jews don't exist. Right? Right. Oh, and by the way, I've known Greeks that were part of the Greek Orthodox Church. And I asked them to pronounce the name in their language. And guess what they said? Jesus. Yeah. Now, there are some variations on how to pronounce it, okay? Have you ever heard the and the? Caribbean, Caribbean, okay? I mean, you know, the and the means the same thing. It's just, you know, it depends on what part of the country you're in. It's either Boston or Boston, Okay, it's just, you know, there are language regional differences. But the, the Greeks pronounced his name Jesus. Okay, and in the English language, it's J-E-S-U-S. -S. So when the Jews tell you that Jesus doesn't exist because there's no J, tell them that there are no Jews because there's no J. So they're just ews. Ews, E W S, ews. Jewish fables, people. Jewish, pay no heed to Jewish fables and commandments of men that turn from the truth. Paul warned us about that. You ever wonder why the, the, the Jews tell you, run around telling you, oh, Paul was a false apostle? Because he blasted the Jews. He told you precisely. To watch out for them. Now, let me tell you something. Just because Mary and Joseph were of the tribe of Judah doesn't necessarily mean that they spoke Hebrew. Now, they might have. I'm not denying that they could have. But the thing was, that part of the world where Jesus was born and like you know, Bethlehem and Galilee and Judea, had been conquered by Alexander the Great. He was a Macedonian, and they spoke Greek. I say the Macedonians and the Greeks were similar people. I mean, you know, they were very similar people. Some say that they were the same. I don't know. I didn't live back then, but they all spoke the same language. And they... The Greeks had conquered this area. And let me tell you something. The reason Mexico speaks Spanish is because Spain conquered Mexico. Okay? When a country conquers another country, the conquered country learns the language. Remember... When Jesus was up on the cross, Pilate had an inscription. It was in Hebrew, in Greek, and in Latin. Now, the Romans had conquered this area from the Greeks. If you went into a Roman court of law, they spoke Latin. If you were a businessman, 
you had better know Greek because Greek was the common language at this time. If you went to the temple, the Jews would probably conduct business, well, their religious business in Aramaic, which was a dialect of Hebrew. Okay? But it's very possible that Jesus' family spoke Greek. I'm not saying they did. But, you know, the thing is, is when you live in an area, for example, Switzerland, do you, there is no Swiss language. Switzerland has three languages. They border on three countries. They border France. They border Austria, which is uh, used to be southern, kind of like southern Germany. And uh, they border Italy to the south. The three languages of Switzerland are German, French, and Italian. And buddy, let me tell you what, almost all of them know at least two of those languages. Most Europeans know at least two languages. Matter of fact, if they only know one language, they consider themselves illiterate. So, but uh, the Austrians are, speak German. Perhaps you've heard of Vienna. So, if you were in that area where Jesus was born, you better know at least, if you wanted to, to do business, you had to know Greek. It was the common language for hundreds of years that the Greeks had conquered the area. The Romans were relatively newcomers. You know, people were learning Latin, but people had known Greek for hundreds of years. So, but when Jesus read the scriptures in the, in the temple, yes, he knew Hebrew. I no doubt that Jesus knew Hebrew. Absolutely none. But when Joseph, who was a carpenter, was doing woodworking, I bet you he spoke Greek because that was the common language. So, in Matthew chapter 8, verse 29, that's your history lesson for today. There was a, somebody that was possessed of a devil, a demon. Matthew 8, 29. And behold, they, the devils, they cried out saying, What have we to do with thee, Jesus, thou son of God? Art thou come, to, come hither to torment us before the time? Oh yeah. They knew Jesus. And Jesus told them, come out of this man. See, there's power. There is power in the name of Jesus. Verse 30. And there was a good way off from them and heard of many swine feeding. So the devils besought him, saying, If thou cast us out, suffer or allow, suffer us to go away into the herd of swine. And he said unto them, Go. And when they were come out, they went into the herd of swine, and behold, the whole herd of swine ran violently down a steep place into the sea and perished in the waters. See, this man had was possessed of devils, and Jesus cast them out. Didn't cast it. They didn't get cast out in the name of Yeshua. No, 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 no. Let's take a look at something. John chapter 14 and verse 13. Jesus speaking. And whatsoever ye shall ask in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. Hmm. So if his name is Jesus, we should be asking in the name of Jesus. So why do the Messianic Jews always want us to use Yeshua? Hmm. Verse 14. 
If ye shall ask anything in my name, I will do it. Maybe because they don't want us to have our prayers and petitions answered. Jesus said, whatsoever, if you ask in my name, if his name is Jesus, that's the name we have to use. Remember the angel of the Lord went to Joseph and he says, thou shalt call his name Jesus. He didn't say, oh, thou shalt call his name Yeshua. Huh. John chapter 15 and verse 16. You have not chosen me. Jesus speaking. You have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you that ye should go and bring forth fruit and that your fruit should remain, that whatsoever ye shall ask of the Father in my name, he may give it you. Are the Messianic Jews trying to rob us of our blessings and petitions in the name of Jesus by having us use the name of Yeshua? You have to ask yourself this question. Hmm. John chapter 16, verse 23. And in that day ye shall ask me nothing. Verily, verily, I say unto you, whatsoever ye shall ask the Father in my name, he will give it you. John 16, 24. Here too have ye asked nothing in my name. Ask, and ye shall receive that your joy may be full. Verse 26. At that day ye shall ask in my name, and I say not unto you that I will pray the Father for you. I think using the name of Jesus is important, don't you? The Bible says his name is Jesus, not Yeshua. The Bible doesn't, in the New Testament, doesn't say Yeshua anywhere. Zero. I don't care what they say. They're little traditions. Well, you know, he was a Hebrew, and he would have spoken Hebrew, and his family would have called him uh, Yeshua. But that's not in the Bible. That's not in the Bible. You know, the family might have spoken some Hebrew, but but they I will guarantee you, when people came to Joseph the carpenter and asked him to make carpentry, things, you know, a carpenter asked him to make things, I'll guarantee you they spoke to him in Greek. Because that was the language of commerce. Jesus, the name above all names. How about 1 John chapter 3 and verse 23? And this is his commandment. Whose commandment? Jesus'. And this is his commandment, that we should believe on the name of his son, Yeshua? No. That we should believe on the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another as he gave us commandment. Ooh. Wow. First John 4, 3. And every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. And this is that spirit of Antichrist, whereof ye have heard that it should come, and even now already is in the world. How about 1 John chapter 2 and verse 22? Who is a liar? Who is a liar? But he that denieth that Jesus is the Christ. He is Antichrist that denieth the Father and the Son. Whosoever denieth the Son, the same hath not the Father. But he that acknowledgeth the Son hath the Father also. 
You ever hear preachers say, well, you know, Jews don't, Jews don't have Jesus, but they got the Father. They don't have the Son, but they got the Father. That's not what John says. John says, if you don't have the Son, you don't have the Father either. You've got, it's either both or nothing. Who is a liar but he that denieth that Jesus is the Christ? So when the Messianic Jews are using Yeshua, are they denying Jesus as Christ? And how come they don't call him Christ? They call him Yeshua HaMashiach. I don't know who Yeshua HaMashiach is. To a, 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 the Shabbat Jews, their Yeshua HaMashiach is Rabbi Schneerson, not the Jesus of this New Testament, my Bible, my scriptures. Yeshua is, you know, it means different things to different people. You know, I'm beginning to wonder, are the Messianic Jews a Trojan horse? Why won't they use the name of Jesus? Why won't they call themselves Christians? Maybe because they're not. All right, turn to Matthew 21, starting in verse 10. And when he, Jesus, and when he was come into Jerusalem, all the city was moved, saying, Who is this? And the multitude said, This is Jesus, the prophet of Nazareth of Galilee. And Jesus went into the temple of God and cast out all them that sold and bought in the temple and overthrew the tables of the money changers and the seats of them that sold doves. And he said unto them, It is written, My house shall be called the house of prayer but ye have made it a den of thieves. You ever see people with those little bracelets, that, you know, WWJD, what would Jesus do? Uh, how about overthrow the tables and take a whip of cords and beat people? <laughs> what would Jesus do? He'd take a whip and beat people. Yeah, that's what Jesus would do. Matter of fact, let's read the... Uh, account of this in John, John chapter 2, uh, let's see, verse 13, and the Jews' Passover was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem, and found in the temple those that sold oxen and sheep and doves, and the changers of money sitting, and when he had made a scourge of small cords, what's a, you know, when you scourge somebody, that means you whip them. That's what it means to be scourged. And when he made a scourge of small cords, he drove them all out of the temple and the sheep and the oxen and poured out the changers' money and overthrew the tables and said unto them that sold doves, Take these things hence, make not my father's house an house of merchandise. And his disciples remembered that it was written, The zeal of thine house hath eaten me up. Wow. What would Jesus do? He'd take a whip and beat people. Oh, yeah. Uh, all right, Matthew 21, verse 13. And he said unto them, It is written, My house shall be called the house of prayer but ye have made it a den of thieves. And the blind and the lame came to him in the temple, and he healed them. And when the chief priests, not the Catholics, the Jews, all right? And when the chief priests and scribes saw the wonderful things that he did, and the children crying in the temple and saying, Hosanna to the son of David, they were sore displeased. Oh, the poor Jews were unhappy. Here it is. Jesus is, is healing the blind and the lame. And the Jews are unhappy because the children are crying, saying, Hosanna to the Son of David. Got to make those Jews happy. Otherwise, you're an anti-Semite, right? 
Now, the word Hosanna has reference to uh, save us or salvation. So when they're saying Hosanna to the highest, they're saying, you know, salvation to the highest, you know, the most high God. All right, this is going to be the end of part one. Look for part two.